they leave out a massive factor. I mean, they acknowledge it, but they don't, I think, fully incorporate the effects of it uh, in in their projections. And I think it's a, a massive flaw in the book. Hello, book lovers. I'm back after a hiatus and a hiatus that hurt me more than it hurt anybody else. Uh, because I'm the one who really misses doing this. And of my 50 subscribers, if even 2% of you missed me, well, to that one person, I'm back, baby. Um, <laughs> I'm. This is actually take two, because while I was filming, I realised that my microphone had a slightly new setup, and I realised that it's causing this kind of ee sound in the background. So scrap that. I'm just using my phone microphone now. But in any case, um, it was practice, just just chalk it down to practice. <laughs> I'm really, really happy to be doing this book malarkey because what a privilege it is to talk about intellectual stuff. Of course, I'm not being paid for it. That's the ultimate privilege. Um, I should have stuck with academia. So I just want to say really quickly before we start the review that I've had a bad run of two and three star books and I wanted this channel to be really a channel all about recommendations and less about like negative reviews, which I think is kind of a waste of time because I personally don't like watching negative reviews. I'm not going to probably not going to read a book that I discovered through a negative review uh, in most cases unless I you know it's I know that my taste is radically different from the reviewer but in any case let's cut to the chase uh, today I'm reviewing a non-fiction called Empty Planet The Shock of Population Decline by John Bricker and Daryl Ibbotson and Although it only attained a three star for me, a three out of five, that is, that's always the case for me. That's how I rate it, according to the Goodreads system. And um, I still think that the the topic is quite timely and not quite, it's, it's extremely timely and worth discussing from that perspective. So I found it interesting, even though I didn't fully agree with everything that they were saying in the book. And I found some problems with it, which we'll get to later. Empty Planet is a bit of a contrarian book because the authors aren't particularly worried about population growth. They're not particularly worried about the global population reaching 10.4 billion by the end of the century, as is predicted by the UN Population Division, which is kind of the main contrasting mainstream adversary or, or, or the 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 projection that the authors are arguing against in the book. The UN, as as of 2024, has, since the book, has revised downward and now they have more modest projections for the century and they think that we'll peak earlier and that we will peak at about 10.4, as I mentioned earlier. But in the book, at the time of writing, it was 11.2 in the 2080s. So... That moves the goalposts a little bit for the authors, but it doesn't really change the main argument, which is that we will peak earlier, actually between 2050 and 2060 in the book, and that we won't reach 9 billion. Things have changed since then. And uh, actually, rather than the authors kind of going back on what they said, they actually think that the situation is grimmer than they thought when they wrote the book. And they think that we may be peaking right now. And they think that's grim because they think population decline brings a lot of negatives with it. Now, you might be wondering, why should I watch this video? Or why would I read that book? What has what relevance has this to my life? Um, whether the population is 8 billion or 9 billion or 10 billion, like what's a few billion on, on a planet the size of Earth? Well, actually, Earth is quite small and there are massive implications for every area of your life <clears throat> when it comes to population. <clears throat> You know, it, it affects things like um, employment and space in the city and real estate and it affects not least the environment. And you may have heard of something called overshoot date. Well, each of us has a consumption pattern and carbon footprint and we demand certain ecological services and resources for how we live our lives every year. And every year we calculate, you, you can check it online, overshoot day every year we tend to have overshoot day earlier and early, earlier in the year. And what that is, is we, by whatever day that is, say it's March 7th, it's different for every country, we reach the limit of what the earth can regenerate in that year in terms of our consumption. That means that we're, we're consuming ahead of what the earth can give us, can provide us. And, you know, there's a certain stockpile and we have a 
we have our methods, but we, we keep borrowing from the future. We keep over placing overly large demands on the earth. Obviously, when you have more people on the planet, that means that if everybody consumes according to what their cultural norm is, the, the more people, the worse for the planet. So at the beginning of the book, the authors give us an overview of the demographic history of Earth for our, our species. And uh, starting 70,000 years ago, um, when we came through a genetic bottleneck, which was, it's theorised, caused by something called the Toba um, super eruption. And they worked from there all the way through to 2019, when the book was published. And uh, this history, as well as giving us context for the present, it also provides them with the opportunity int to introduce the demographic transition model, uh, which is a, at the currently a five stage model to kind of mark when populations move through developmental stages, their population, their, their fertility rate changes as well as their mortality rate. So the population fluctuates according to these two factors. And uh, obviously I'm not going to give you that full history, but what I can say is that um, very various different events have caused the human population to ebb and flow. So such as famine, you know, obviously, you know, there would be death tolls with famines and things like the fall of an empire or wars or pandemics. But at the same time, you know, one empire falls and another rises up in its ashes and that causes a population boom then. And so there's there have been these kinds of fluctuations. Also, we move into a new region uh, of the or of the planet and then our population is able to flourish there, maybe because there is no competition, relatively little competition for us um, and lots of space and resources. And but overall, our population has been climbing over history, but very, very, very slowly for the most part, until it reaches the Victorian times. This is because in the Victorian era, we also had the industri Industrial Revolution, which brought improved medicine and better living conditions, improved public health. And what happened then is that we moved from stage one of the demographic transition model into stage two. And for most of history, we'd had high mortality rates and high birth rates. And when we moved into the Victorian era and stage two, our birth rates remained high, but the mortality rate began to fall. So we had this boom in the population, massive growth uh, of the population. And then by the early 20th century, um, a few different countries like the United States and let me see, Canada and some countries in Europe entered stage three when their mortality rate continued to fall even more rapidly, but the birth rate fell more rapidly still, but still remained high enough for populations to continue to grow. Examples of countries that remain in stage three are, uh, I believe, Botswana, Colombia, India, Jamaica, Kenya, Mexico and South Africa. And while there are many factors that influence population growth, the main catalyst, according to the authors, is urbanisation. So the reason urbanisation tends to cause a falling birth rate are myriad and they kind of the different causes intersect and affect each other and the first one is that while on a farm children are another pair of working hands and you know they're they're an asset on a farm when you need you know the more workers the better um in the city they're often a liability and then the second thing is education women's education specifically when women move into the city they become more likely to receive an education and as women receive an education, their birth rate is only a matter of time before the birth rate falls. Because having lots and lots of children happens not to be in the best interests of women and, you know, society in general, actually. Educated women have more options. They're more aware of options. And they tend to want to work for a wage or salary that affords them a certain autonomy. And children tend to be an impediment to women's careers because in most of the world, Caring for children remains primarily a woman's duty. And as a corollary of women's education, religiosity tends to fall. Like children are very um, influenced by their mothers as well. So the family tends to become less religious. It's just correlated with education. And religiosity, like the intensity of how religious you are, is associated with having more children. If you're if you're religious, you, 
those populations will have more children and and they're different for different religions so i think it's the birth rate the average birth rate for muslims is 3.1 and for buddhists it's what is it again 1.6 it's not that necessarily that religions are are kind of coercing people into having more children although that does happen i mean look at catholicism but it, progressive values tend to replace religious values and they're associated with having fewer children so you could say that as well as urbanization being a factor in bringing down birth rate um women's education is an important factor in bringing down the birth rate and if that can occur in rural areas i mean there's there are, again there are more factors i'm oversimplifying everything so that i can fit this into a video um you know there there's something called kin dominant societies and government dominant societies and kin dominant societies tend to influence people to have more kids generally speaking but in any case if women in rural areas get an education this effect of lowering the birth rate also will apply and right now most developed countries would be classified as being in stage four where the mortality rate is low and the birth rate is low and the idea is that the birth rate will continue to fall until 2.1 which is the replacement rate for a population and then therefore the population will stabilize but if that sounds a little bit too good to be true or a little bit artificial well what we're seeing now is yes it doesn't just happen that way it continues to change so anything below 2.1 causes the population to decline to decrease um, and it doesn't happen instantaneously because obviously the people who are alive have to go on being alive for a while and the people of reproductive age will continue to have children and if there are many of them even if they're all having one child that will mean that there still is quite a supply of children coming on board so to speak um, and this is called some this is something called population momentum it's kind of a lag a delay in in the decline of the population after the birth rate comes down but if you look at a, a map of the birth rates in 2021 you'll see that we it looks like we are heading for a future in which children will become a rarity if you look at india it's rapidly approaching replacement rate um, and some dem demographers say that it's actually below replacement rate now the authors argue that several African countries, and they, they use Kenya as the as the exemplary, are actually rapidly heading towards replacement rate as well. And Africa as a continent is seen as, uh, as, as the one kind of bastion of a growing population rate in the world. And that's where most babies are going to be born in the future, if you were to go by the trends. But, but it's really fascinating in the book. They... They often, they, they travel around to go to different countries and they interview people. And like, I don't really, you know, I have a bone to pick there. But anyway, it, it is fascinating. It makes for an interesting read. And what they discover is that in Kenya, um, its own kin dominated culture actually can work against it in, in the presence of women's education and is actually reinforcing the effect of a decreasing population, of a decreasing birth rate, I beg your pardon. The authors are under no illusion when it comes to how far Africa as a whole, and uh, there are some countries doing better than others, but by and large, it has a long way to go in terms of gender equality. Um, but they're saying that there's light on the horizon and the trends are showing that generally speaking, there, there's a movement towards gender equality. And with that, what will come is women's education and subsequently falling birth rates and they believe that that will be the, the urbanization and and women's education the interplay there will be the primary driver in the 21st century of the decline of population here's a quote from the book that i uh, highlighted i quite liked there is no better measure of the progress of a society than the progress of women within that society they posit that a girl's education could be the single biggest determinant of development of lower income countries. And the patterns are very consistent. If lower income or any country wants to develop, they, they must invest in their women. And if you invest in women, it, it affects more than just women. It, it affects, obviously affects the birth rate. That's what we're talking about. But it has many other positive effects. So if you educate women, you reduce the likelihood of malnutrition, you decrease child and maternal mortality rates, you reduce childhood marriage, you boost the health of the economy, the whole family, the whole community, in fact, becomes healthier and more resilient. And of course, fewer children are born. And after stage four, there's stage five, which remains theoretical because there isn't really enough evidence to say for sure what happens in stage five. But a few 
parts of the world like Japan and some Eastern European countries are already being placed um, outside of stage four, that, that category and being plopped into stage five um, because mortality rates are overtaking birth rates. Theoretically, it, it takes a generation or two before you start to see the effect on the population. And this is because, as I explained earlier, um, because of a phenomenon called demographic um, momentum. It's like once you've produced a lot of people, it takes a while before those people kind of die, I guess. And, and it also takes a while before the, the, the people of reproductive age were having far fewer children. Maybe the birth rate is very low, but they're still having some children. And since there are so many of them, so many parents, that's still quite a lot, lot new, of new people. And then um, mortality rates, longevity is a factor as well. So people are living longer, generally speaking, it takes a while for the population to start to go into decline. If you think about in 1999, um, with a birth rate of 2.7, the world hit 6 billion. It's hard to believe that like, it was 1999 when we hit 6 billion. We hit 8 billion a quarter of a century later with a birth rate of 2.3. It had dropped by four decimal points and we still added 2 billion to the total of the Earth's population. There's a lot of fallibility when it comes to demographic projections and the authors acknowledge that even a 0 0.5 variation can have a mass, make a massive difference in the projections. And obviously the further that you're trying to project ahead, the bigger the divergence in projections. One of the methodologies that the UN uses in trying to forecast the populations of different countries is to look at countries that um, are further along in their economic development and, and then sort of mapping their, their um, progress onto the projections for, for less developed countries. But the authors are quite critical of this methodology because they think that what the UN, UN is doing is neglecting new factors that are coming into play um, and relying too heavily on how the state of the world as it used to be. And I agree with the authors, if it's true that in 2019, the UN was failing to factor in things like women's education and women's employment. This is the crux of the matter for the authors, because they think that we are expanding on women's education so quickly. And it probably has something also to do with technological advancements that, you know, people have access to global news now and they can see um, how people are living in different parts of the world and they want to buy into that. We're becoming more and more globalized. And they think that given this rapidly changing state of the world, that we will never reach 9 billion, that will go into stage five very soon. So the authors criticize the UN for of recency bias, which is this fallacy of thinking that the conditions are going to remain the same going into the future. But I think it's kind of ironic because in my opinion, and I'll get to this later when I get to the sort of impressions stage of the video, um, they leave out a massive factor. I mean, they acknowledge it, but they don't, I think, fully incorporate the effects of it uh, in, in their projections. And I think it's a, a massive flaw in the book. So let's talk about some of the effects of population decline. What does it do? Um, one, of it, one of the phenomena around population decline is that it's self-perpetuating. It's sticky. So, and this is because of a phenomenon called the low fertility trap, where the norms of a culture start to change when we have fewer and fewer children and it, the culture becomes less family oriented and becomes more individualistic and people become less willing to give up the freedoms associated with childlessness, childlessness. So Japan and South Korea have shockingly low birth rates as individual nations, but the authors place Western Europe at the vanguard and also Northern Europe at the vanguard of population decline because Europe is the most secular region in the world. It's the most urbanized and also it, ha it has the, the lowest gender inequality. And these um, characteristics work together to create like a, a society where the cultural norm is to have fewer and fewer children. France, Wales and England hit replacement rate already in the 1940s and the marriage rate is half of what it was in 1965 across Europe. And I can see this myself in my own peers, my own generation of millennials and I suppose the upcoming generation of Gen Zers are going to have this characteristic in spades as well. For a large cohort of young and increasingly middle-aged people, um, 
a housing crisis prevents us from getting onto the property ladder. And the authors promise that with the declining population, we'll actually see the freeing up of space and this crisis will start to diminish and eventually disappear. And another upside or two other upsides of this decreasing population is that the price of essential goods will come down and, and the burden that we placed on the environment will decrease as well. But there are many downsides to a decreasing population as well because the growing population of older people places a greater burden on a diminishing population of younger people who have to support them. Additionally, those who have their savings wrapped up in real estate will find that, that those savings might be wiped out as house prices fall and economic growth will diminish because if you reduce the amount of young people, you reduce consumption because young people are really the big consumers in a society because they have to make all the big purchases like new cars and new house. And, you know, they tend to consume more because they have children and that kind of thing. And another less uh, intuitive one, perhaps, is that with a, a dearth of youth, the authors predict a dearth of innovation because they say that most innovation is actually um, generated amongst young people. Japan and South Korea uh, as stage five countries, theoretically, arguably, um, provide cautionary tales because um, although their, their standard of living is quite high, their big economies, Japan has villages that are so devoid of human life now that they have mannequins in the shops, in the buildings to try and uh, cheer people up and make it look like it's that the villages have vitality still. And uh, Japan is now the most indebted country in the world. In South Korea, due to traditional age-based hierarchies, older workers clog the system and young workers, there just isn't the space for them to progress in their careers. And they have to give up on things like their career. And, and in association with that, they have to give up on things like family and even dating. And then obviously, if you're giving up on marriage and dating in a traditional society, you're also giving up on having children. Korea has one has, I think, the worst uh, poverty rate amongst the elderly in the developed world. And if the trend of this decreasing birth rate in South Korea continues, it's predicted that the last Korean will die in 2750. The authors are very clear that they are advocates of economic growth and they see economic growth as essential. And I would probably depart at that point. Well, on various different issues, but that's one of the things that I, I depart from their view on. They say that if countries want to avert economic depression, what they're going to have to do is put the brakes on population decline. One of the things that we see countries doing now is um, programs to try and encourage people to have more children. But historically, these haven't really proven their efficacy. Their opposite, which is programs to reduce the fertility rate, have been incredibly successful. Like just see China, for example. The alternative and wiser proposal that the authors have for solving the problem of population decline is a natural phenomenon that has been with us since almost the dawn of our species, and that is migration. Countries have to make a concerted effort to welcome immigrants. So they rightly deride far right, typically like far right notions that. Of, of the kind of, you know, your, is, Europe will be overtaken by Islam um, in a few years and that kind of thing, because there, there are many reasons that this is not going to be the case. And one of them is that um, immigrant, immigrant populations will take on the birth rate of the host population within a generation. And the other reason is that the forecasts show that Muslims will not constitute more than a tenth of Europe's population even by 2050. You know, there's all this talk about the evils of immigration in Europe and America. And, and the reality is that of the 27 Im migrants in Europe in the last, what was it, in the last 25 years, half of them, almost half of them, were born in Europe. So they were Europeans moving around. So really the reality on the ground is being warped for political purposes. It's not being conveyed, honestly. More to the point, the, what has to be accepted and, and understood is that Immigration is not an, a, a zero-sum gain. It provides an, a net gain for everybody involved. And um, a 2016 study by the National Academics of Science, Engineering and Medicine reported that more than half of legal immigrants in the US over the past 20 years had a post-secondary education. 
There was little evidence that immigration significantly affected the overall employment levels of native born workers, and they rarely created competition between themselves and native born workers. Instead, they filled gaps in demand for highly skilled workers and created jobs through their high rates of entrepreneurship. Most Americans realized this. I mean, America is built on, was built by immigrants. A danger comes from the recent metastasis of the far right and um, you know, stoking fears of immigration. But the authors are also very critical of the left. And this is because they think that the way that they promote um, immigration is leans too heavily on the idea of personal virtues and acceptance and tolerance. And the authors argue that this backfires because most people tend to react defensively to these appeals to virtue because they feel that it is attacking their own persona and their, their own standards of, of virtu virtuousness. Um, and then they double down on their unvirtuous <laughs> beliefs and habits because people are just swell like that. Um, <laughs> so they argue that instead of instead of leaning heavily on these, like the, 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 the idea that we morally should accept immigrants, we should be utilising the reality that immigration is actually good for all and there are selfish reasons to welcome immigrants. And they warn that if Europe, Asia and the United States don't make this concerted effort to welcome in new immigrants, their populations will go into decline, they will age and they will find it increasingly difficult to compete with Africa, a continent who is going to remain youthful and whose population is going to grow into the future. You know, promising growth is more attractive to investors than the promise of decline and, aging, and aging. The The authors talk about the American century and America having its second century um, and this really hinging on whether or not it starts to welcome immigrants. It's, it's a very competitive destination for immigrants uh, for many reasons but yeah it often looks like we're watching a slow-mo um, crash and burn of the of this, that that cultural superpower. In many ways, the future is going to be a matter of developed countries competing against each other to attract um, a decreasing pool of immigrants to their own shores. The authors hold up their own country, Canada, as a model, an aspirational model for the rest of the world. Europe, America, everybody should emulate Canada, and this is because. Canada is supposedly exceptionally welcoming to immigrants and they the reason they give for this is that Canada doesn't have a strong national identity so it therefore doesn't have a, a strong feeling of the in-group and the out-group which in this case is a great t asset and I, and I agree with this I don't think that nationalism is an asset in general um, but it makes them exceptionally welcoming. The annual intake for Canada of immigrants is 1% of the overall population and this is the figure that they recommend for other countries. This is supposed to be a sort of manageable figure that uh, can buoy up the population sufficiently and allow for continued population growth. And most crucially they say they don't want to hold Canada up as like a moral hero. They want to recommend that countries conduct this openness to immigration through public policy that reflects collective benefit rather than um, philanthropic goodwill. So finally we get to the impressions part of the video and so I want to say that I agree with the authors that I also think I'm not an expert and I, my opinion is not worth much but I do think that we will be inclined to peak before the UN predicts us uh, peaking but I am critical of a number of, of things that the authors say in the book and I want to add a, a couple more ingredients to the predictive soup. The first one is that I discovered with a little bit of digging that there was problems in the book with accurate representation of the research of demographers. I don't think they emphasized enough the good track record of the UN Population Division. And I know that they're saying that, you know, that the, that the UN is really, they're critical of it because of recency bias. And they think that, you know, they don't specifically say that they haven't been or have been good at predicting um, the population growth in the fact in, in the past. But in fact, they have been extremely accurate. And, and that's kind of not given the attention it's due. Um, when it comes to short and medium term projections, 
the UN has a really good track record of predicting where the population is going. It's just when it goes beyond 50 years, we're talking about 50 or 100 year projections, then the, the projections tend to diverge from reality because that's just, again, there are unforeseeable factors. The UN understands this and that's why they give a number of different projections and um, like medium and sort of high projections and low projections. And they keep revising all the time in light of the new evidence. So Ibbotson and Bricker, I found, misrepresent the landscape of views. And it's unfortunate if it's the case, but it might be to strengthen their own views. So they draw on two demographers, uh, Jorgen Randers and a Deutsche Bank report by Sanjeev Sanyal. And they're both outliers in the field. And that in itself doesn't mean they're incorrect, but the, the overall view of what's going on in the area of demography is a bit skewed by, by focusing so heavily on outliers. It becomes a problem to use demographic research uh, to support your view when that demographic research isn't represented correctly. And um, so they interview a demographer called Wolfgang Lutz of IIASA, and he predicts that the population will peak by 2070 at around 9.5 billion, which is more and later than their own projections. And furthermore, they don't mention in the book that they cherry pick a scenario among many by the IS, IIASA that the IIASA considers to be a less likely scenario. They just take that less likely scenario because it's the lowest and they use that to support their own projections when in fact it's even later and uh, higher than their own. It's worth reiterating that their predictions for when we would we would reach 8 billion were 18 years off the mark, which is quite <laughs> quite flawed when you compare that with the, the UN's models, which are quite accurate. Uh, and I do think that they lean a little bit heavily on anecdotal evidence from street interviews. Um, they go to dinners with young people and they ask them about their lives and their aspirations and that kind of thing. And then like that, that kind of fluffs up the book a little bit too much. And they, it's almost like they're saying that this is more rigorous research than the research done by demographers. So my main criticism is that there are even more factors at play, despite the authors criticizing the UN of recency bias and not incorporating all the factors into their models. There's like a, a huge factor that's left out in my opinion, by the authors, and that is the effect of climate change on the population. They talk about the effect of population on the climate and the environment, but they don't talk much about the reverse, the, the effect of, of a increasingly chaotic environment on the population. I mean, we're looking at effects like the desertification of even southern Europe. Uh, a lot of places will become un uninhabitable uh, of, of temperatures reaching 50 degrees for much of the year in some locations, which is just not livable for human beings. And we're looking at the depletion of aquifers that currently um, supply areas, fertile areas that provide an enormous amount of food to the global food network. And this is all within the coming century. I mean, it, it seems to me to be a gross oversight to not to factor this into your projections, not to even really mention it in the book. I do think population size has a, an impact on the environment, but it's not the only factor, you know, like there are different patterns, patterns of consumption in the world. I, I think that we are remiss if we don't talk about how we can change those patterns of consumption. They, are obviously advocates of like the need for economic growth and there's no other way for human beings to flourish other than in economies that grow. But I don't think we should take it for granted that as we become more developed that we necessarily are going to follow the consumption patterns of other countries in the past who became developed, you know? And I think again, this is an issue of recency bias. So, so my point is that it's, and I'll give you an example of this, of this in a moment. My point is that it's not all about population size, it's also about behavior. In a period called the Quaternary Extinction between 52,000 and 9,000 years ago, um, the world lost more than a hundred of its megafauna, species such as the European lion and um, the mastodon in North America, and um, a whole group of species called the glyptodonts, which were a kind of giant armadillo. And the interesting thing is that these extinctions coincided uncannily 
with the arrival of humans in the regions where the extinctions took place. So, for example, when we moved into Europe, there was like a, a sudden explosion of extinctions. And then when we moved into Asia and Oceania, it was the same thing. And then we moved across the Bering Land Bridge into the Americas. And there was very, very devastating extinctions then um, after humans moved there. And that's theorized to be because um, animals in the Americas had had so little exposure to to humans before that point and they had no defences against us. Basically, we brought death with us wherever we went, regardless of the fact that we were travelling as pioneers in small numbers and we were, you know, our populations hadn't really established themselves in those regions. On the face of it, it makes sense to look at the 20th century and the massive growth in the population and then how we consumed in 50 years more than we had consumed as a species in our entire history beforehand and 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 then you know create a, a law whereby those two parameters of population growth and consumption are are linked and they always will be but this is kind of to ignore other factors like our particular way that we developed uh, with fossil fuels and the particular culture and ideology that we developed under um, it's simplistic to just choose those two parameters and see a pattern and go, oh, well, these always come together, you know. I, I don't see it as an inevitability that as population size grows, so does the devastation of the biosphere. And on the other hand, you know, um, I don't necessarily think that the devastation of the biosphere reduces as the population diminishes. We do also have to think about how we're behaving, how our society, the systems of the world um, that we're devising, are they in sync with the natural world or are they um, in conflict with it? If, if everybody lived like the average American, we'd need 5.1 Earths. If everybody lived like the average Irish person, I'm from Ireland, if you haven't guessed, um, we'd need 3.3. And if you lived like the average um, Jamaican, one would be just fine. <laughs> if the solution to our problem of declining population is migration, and if we're willing to allow people coming into the country to adopt the same consumption patterns of the host that are the norm in the host country, then we could be looking at um, exacerbating our problem rather than solving it. So whilst I agree with the authors that will probably our global population will probably peak before 2100, the reasons for why I think that is so are different from, from the authors. I'm not sure that the necessary conditions for population growth into the second half of the century are going to be there. But this is why I think that Ibbotson and Bricker are over-optimistic when it comes to their, the method of, of, of forecasting. Yes, the African continent is supposed to be where most population growth will happen. But at the same time, it's also one of the regions of the world that's supposed to be most affected by climate change in the coming century. And this also goes for <clears throat> equatorial and regions and tropical regions around the world and also coastal areas. They just seem to be overstating the case when they say that uh, a declining population will heal the earth within the century or within the lifetimes of children born today. And additionally, their prediction that uh, the life expectancy at the end of the century will be 150 years seems to be like just blatantly ignoring the conditions on the ground at the moment and the forecasts by the IPCC. And the authors really, you know, they put forward this solution that we all follow, to, follow in Canada's footsteps and promote immigration um, because, you know, already it's going to become so competitive to attract immigrants because um, it might be immigration might be falling already. And but, you know, if they paid more attention to climate projections um, as they do to population projections, they might realize that this is just the tip of the iceberg and the migration has just gotten started. And we're looking at potentially the biggest migration that the Earth has ever seen. As I said earlier, like our, our collective behavior is as important as our population size, but at the same time, um, you know, they, they advocate for a growing population in countries if you want your economy to flourish. 
Um, and I get that. I understand working under the capitalist model. I understand how that's necessary. But when it comes to the human outcome, uh, our past conduct as humans doesn't do much to inspire faith in ourselves. And I think that I want as little possible. I'm sure you'll agree if you're on the same page. I want as little as possible to rest on our powers of self-constraint and our ability to take the long-term view. You know, that just seems like another hurdle. We're not very wise as a species. Let's make it as easy as possible for us to get it right. And uh, let's just let the population decline. I want to say more on this, but I'm going to spare you because I know this video is already too long and I'm not very good at editing and I'm not very good at weeding out the redundancies and the self-indulgences and all that stuff. I think that these non-fiction in particular warrants a bit of a discussion and hopefully that's what I've inspired you to do in the comments. Um, uh, you may have a view that's radically different from the authors or myself and I'd love to hear it. To those of you who stuck to the end, thank you so much. I am so grateful to you. Um, it's such an honour to be able to make videos like this and have people actually engage with it online. And um, hopefully I can sustain this into the future and keep doing this because it's absolute. It's an absolute pleasure. And until then, stay well, stay curious and stay reading.